Greetings, Otaku Faithful. Thank you for joining me again this week. Once again, it's Larry Williams, OAW Commander in Chief, and I'm here to kick off my new comic book Hollywood segment right here on Otaku Assemble Weekly. Now, as you guys know, I'm back from my little hiatus on YouTube, and this week I'm kicking off all of my new segments for the spring 2012 schedule. Earlier in this week, I introduced my discussion of the week segment, and then of course yesterday I uploaded my anime favorites for January of 2012. Ten today, or tonight, <laughs> I am going to kick off my new comic book Hollywood segment. Now, comic book Hollywood is going to be my new string of movie reviews. However, these movie reviews are going to specifically focus on comic book adapted films that exist in Hollywood. Now, before I jump into this video, I want to give a huge, huge shout out to Captain Logan of um, Geekvolution's YouTube channel. If you all can, I highly recommend you all check out that channel. I just discovered it about two months ago. I'm a huge fan of the channel and my favorite segment on that channel is Superhero Rewind. Superhero Rewind is Captain Logan's in-depth analysis of superhero films and it, any type of superhero film, not even comic book superhero films because he's done like, he's done some of the, the old serial superheroes like The Shadow, The Phantom, uh, The Rocketeer, he's done The Incredibles. Those videos are great and so I was inspired by those videos to start off my own segment However, this segment will not be, it, it, it won't just be superhero films. What I hope to achieve with this segment is that I will encompass, um, I will review films that encompass a bunch of comic book adaptations. So, uh, hopefully later on the list we'll get to things like Sin City, uh, History of Violence, Road to Perdition, all of which are films that are uh, inspired where their, their source material lies in comic books, but they aren't superheroes. So, uh, and also, how can you guys get on the action? Well, in the comments below, give me suggestions for which movie you'd like to see me review next week. Believe it or not, most of the comic book adapted films that have been made since, I want to say, X-Men, so since 2000, I actually have seen uh, numerous times, in fact. Uh, and then, of course, I have a rather large collection of superhero films, except uh, they're not all on hard copy. Don't judge me. It's so damn tempting to download. Please don't judge me. Anywho, but with all of that said, I'm going to go ahead and jump into my review. And to kick off uh, Comic Book Hollywood, I decided to take a look at a film that I actually just got done watching um, I believe it was last week. I finally sat down and I watched this film. Funny thing, I've had it for a very long time. Uh, matter of fact, I've had it since it's since it came out on uh, on home media. But I forgot I had it. It was sitting on my external hard drive, and when I was cleaning out my uh, computer last week, I found it. And I was like, "Oh shit, I haven't watched this yet." Anywho, what I'm talking about is All Star Superman. This is the. Um, this is one of the latest, not the latest, because I think the latest DC animated film is uh, was Batman Year One, which any of you all who's checked out my review on KillerFilm.com, that's where you can find my review of Batman Year One. So if you haven't checked out, uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, KillerFilm.com, uh, and just search Batman Year One review and you'll find my review of that film. But I believe this was the one before Batman Year One to come out. Um, DC animated film, direct to video. And it is the it is the animated adaptation of the highly acclaimed uh, graphic novel by Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely. So uh, let's jump into this review now. Just so you guys know, I am still using the same format from my previous movie reviews. However, I'm currently working on reconstructing this format. So in my later reviews, if the setup does kind of change. Don't freak out. So I'm going. 
actually, instead of doing my spoiler and then my spoiler free and then my spoiler uh, sections of this video, I'm just going to make this video spoiler free. I'm going to try my best to do that. I won't give out any huge spoilers. So let's jump into this. Let's start off with a brief summary. All Star Superman, um, the film. The film is, in essence, it's the it's the story of Superman dealing with his uh, his potential death. The film opens up with Superman saving a uh, a crew of scientists, a crew of astronauts who are making the first man-made trip to the sun. And we find out in the film that that whole, that situation, it was a setup to get Superman to swoop and save the day. Lex Luthor purposely orchestrated an attack on the astronaut and scientist crew so that Superman would arrive to save them. The point was to do this. Superman being that close to the sun, he he assumed he took in too much yellow sun radiation and because of that it sent his body pretty much Superman Superman became a, a battery that was overjuiced. Uh, he became a, a circuit breaker that that had too much of a surge in it. And of course, you all know, circuit breakers with too much of a surge, they short out. So that, in essence, is what happened to Superman. He, he, he got a condition, he developed a condition where uh, he was, he had borrowed time. And so the film kind of encompasses his last, I want to say his last, few months i want to say the last six months last six months of superman's life and and so like the graphic novel there are numerous tales in the movie however uh the overarching plot of lex luthor uh, going to prison and being sen sentenced to death and coming to grip gr coming to grips grasp excuse me grips Excuse me, been a long day. Coming to grips with uh, the idea that while he too is dying, he has managed to successfully kill Superman also. And so, uh, but then of course we find out that, you know, Lex, he always has an ace in the hole. He always has something up his sleeve. So of course, he's not going away that easy. And he has constituencies in place for his grand scheme, which is which we find out about towards the end of the film. But that, that's pretty much the film's biggest plot. Now, like I said, all of the other smaller stories that are subplots, uh, they do appear in the film, some of them. But like I said, they're smaller subplots. And me personally, I felt like these subplots had much more legitimacy in the graphic novel rather than in the film. And... Uh, Matter of fact, um, I'll go ahead and I'll get into some of those subplots right now. Uh, a few of the subplots in the film uh, that do exist in the graphic novel are the the uh, the Superwoman subplot, where Clark um, he he reveals his secret to Lois, and he brings her to the fortress, and you know he woos her, and they have a romantic evening and all that jazz. But the the big surprise, the big thing was, it was the day before Lois's birthday, and so for Lois's birthday, Clark had managed to create a formula based off of Lois's DNA that would give her his powers for 24 hours. And of course, he went ahead and he made her a costume and all that jazz so that they can kind of fight crime as a superhero couple for her birthday. Which, um, like I said, that subplot, while that subplot does have weight in the main plot because we find out that it's that super formula that Lex steals and that he uses in his constituency plan towards the end of the film. So that subplot does have some weight in the film because, like I said, super formula... Lex uses it, you know, it, you, you have to bring up that question, you know, if Lex was going to use that super formula, how would he get it? It's not like he could, 
It's not like he could create him himself. Why? He doesn't know, uh, he, d he doesn't have that type of information on Superman. However, if Superman was to create it and Lex was simply to steal it, okay, that makes sense. But why would Superman make a super formula for Lois? So that subplot actually fits within the main plot. And like I said, while it was done relatively well in the film, I think it was done much better in the graphic novel. It has, it has more weight. Uh, it, it takes more time to develop it and it really was a well-composed romantic piece for the graphic novel. But like I say, in the film, that's probably the most significant subplot. Um, the smaller subplots were like the, the confrontation with Atlas and Samson, which is part of the Superwoman subplot, but I felt like that could have been left out of the film. I really don't I, I don't I don't think it's it was significant to the film at all yes once again as I said it's part of the Superwoman subplot but it's so small compared to the to the overarching storyline that I don't know why it was in the film uh, however the subplot that I do want to talk about is the give me a second I want to go ahead and make sure I don't mispronounce any of the characters names yeah the Bar Rail and uh, Lilo storyline. Once it, okay, the, that subplot. Uh, the first, I, I believe they were the first, but they were definitely the most uh, successful. The most successful Kryptonian astronauts who were away from Krypton when it uh, exploded. You know, they survived. And when Clark takes a trip out into space. Uh, it differs in the graphic novel and in the movie, his reasonings for that. In the graphic novel, he was returning his pet, uh, his pet Sun Eater uh, to his homeland in space. And so when he came back, that's when Barrel and uh, Lilo, uh, Lilo, Lilo, I think it's Lilo, is how you pronounce it, or Lila, they follow Clark back to Earth. They follow Clark back to Earth. Uh, in the film, it's when Clark uh, returns the small candor that he has stored in the fortress. He returns it. Um, uh, he goes to Mars and he sets those Kandorians free. And then, of course, when he comes back to Earth, they follow him. So the reasoning differs in the in the film. But what happens is when Clark returns to Metropolis, he finds out that Barrel and his wife have kind of taken it over. And they are... They are starting their, you can call it their campaign to take over Earth, and of course it's it's, it's a nice, it's a nice little spin on a uh, on the Superman tale because they are what what Clark could have been if he didn't if he wasn't raised on Earth if he wasn't raised by the Kents you know the idea that they know that they're a superior race to the humans and so when they show up of course they want to take their rightful place at the top of the chain. So Clark having to confront them and having to, you know, I mean, hell, I think they even mention in the movie, Barrell is his uncle, I believe. Like, that's his aunt and uncle, if memory serves me correctly, because they're part of the House of L. Um, they're part of the L family, so they're either his uncle or his cousins. But Clark has to face members of his own family who want to take over his homeland. Well, how do you deal with that? Let me tell you why I want to talk about this subplot. It's because this subplot, is, it doesn't get enough time in the film. Like I said, the whole Samson Atlas thing, I felt could have been left out of the film. But this subplot, I wanted to see more of. And I mean, this whole thing was wrapped up in about 8, maybe 10 minutes. That's a stretch. 10 minutes. I think it was wrapped up in like 8 minutes. The subplot was started and it was wrapped up real quickly and i really wanted to see them expound expand on that subplot i thought that was good i mean hell um just from a literary standpoint you're talking about superman in his dying days and he has to face a part of his past a part of his kryptonian heritage that's fucking cool but it was like i said what was in the movie wasn't bad but i felt like it could have been better so, I felt kind of let down on that. Uh, okay, another subplot I want to address, which is technically is not so much of a subplot because it's actually part of the overarching story, 
is the uh, the prison riot when when Clark visits Lex in prison and there's the whole little confrontation in prison. It takes place in the middle of this film. I thought that was great. Uh, that was my favorite part of the movie. That was that was great. It was really cool to see uh, to see Clark, you know, try to use his powers around Lex, but to keep him. To keep Lex from figuring out that he was Superman, you know, so he's he's trying to keep his his secret identity intact and that type of jazz. I, I thought it was really cool. Uh, and at the same time, he's fighting Parasite. He's fighting a super villain. So I thought that was kind of awesome. Um, also, because that was the first scene in the movie where we actually got into Lex's head. We knew that Lex was responsible for the the sabotage mission to the sun, but we didn't know all of his reasoning behind it. We didn't know what, what what he was thinking mentally and emotionally about the whole ordeal. And that's when we finally got inside of Lex's head in that scene. So I really did. I love that whole little that whole little whole little um, situation that took place in the prison. I thought that was done really well. And um, and yeah, I thought I think that's. No, I'll just leave it there. I thought it was done really well. Okay, so... Let's see. Alright, so let's see. I have acting. Roa, I, I just discussed the writing. Um, the dialogue... The di I thought the dialogue was really, well, uh, was really good. Um, of course, as is my opinion on most of Superman stories... Uh, in many super in many Superman stories, I always feel like Lex has the best dialogue of any other character, and this is no exception. I mean, Lex's dialogue, like I said, in the prison, it was great. Uh, hell, even his monologue at the end, I, I really did love that. Uh, so the dialogue was good, except for Superman's dialogue, not Clark's. When he was actual actually Superman, um, during the during the Superwoman subplot. I felt like that di that dialogue just didn't connect with me, um, because in a way, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with we're dealing with Superman coming coming clean with Lois. He's he's opening up to Lois, but he still talks like he's Superman. He's not talking like himself. He's talking like he's putting on a performance. Like he's still talking. He's not talking to her as Hey Lois, you know this is me, Clark. He's talking to her as, hey, Lois, this is me, Superman, the, you know, the, 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 the icon that you know of. That's why I felt like the dialogue wasn't working there. Whereas if you talk, if you look at the Barrel subplot, when it was him talking like kal like Ka that was kal speaking, that dialogue was very believable. That's when, that's when, that was, that was Superman's best dialogue. That and, of course, the, the final uh, confrontation at the end. That was his best dialogue in the film. So, uh, okay, I skipped acting. Let me go back into acting because acting is a little bit harder to gauge with an animated film. So, of course, you have to, you have to, you have to criticize the voice acting. And the voice acting, I will say, I don't think the voice acting lived up to some of the previous cast that we have seen in Superman films and in, in Superman the Animated Series uh, and also in uh, the Justice League because you know when you're talking about when you're talking about the voice actors that made the Superman animated universe popular I mean most of these actors aren't in the film uh, this was pretty much a brand new cast much like in I believe in uh, Superman Doomsday had a new cast also um, and I would probably put the voice acting among, along the same lines as what was found in Superman Doomsday. So I wasn't very impressed by by the voice acting in this film. Uh, Christina Hendricks does the voice acting for Lois in this film. Um, and she was probably my favorite performance in the film. Um, yeah, probably... Yeah, she was probably my favorite performance in the film. Uh, so, hey. But, uh, okay, uh, cinematography, in this case, would be animation. The animation was good. I did, I did like the animation. Um, 
favorite scene, favorite animated scene would uh, would be the uh, the fight with uh, what was that? What was that? The uh, give me a minute. It's uh, I'm trying to remember that villain's name. Uh, Solaris. Yes, the fight with Solaris. That 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 was my favorite animated scene. Uh, I, I I just thought that. You know, the, the scene with them in space and you have the robot Superman and then you have Superman in the white outfit. Uh, I just thought that was beautifully animated. I thought that was really well done. Also, the final fight with Lex when, you know, when they were uh, hitting each other and you saw the, gla like the, uh, the glass from the skyscrapers just shattering and stuff. I thought that was really well animated. So, yeah, the animation was pretty good. Is what it, it was what it's what I would expect from a DC animated film. Um, not particularly special, but right on par with what I would expect. So the music, um, which in this case music was done by Christopher Drake in this film, um, the music it was it was okay. Um, it wasn't bad. It was uh, it was appropriate for certain scenes. You know uh, the way they used the music. To control the tempo and control the feel, the way they paced it throughout the scenes, it was done really well. Um, so yeah, I don't have. It was good. Not, I don't really have any complaints about the music. Um, but before I jump off this review, I do want to go ahead and make this note because uh, I was surprised when I looked. I was surprised when I looked this film up and I looked at the the cast and crew, and uh, apparently. Dwayne McDuffie uh, wrote um, wrote the film. Um, he, you know, he he developed the adaptation for it. And for any of you all who may know, Dwayne McDuffie is um, he's a comic book writer. Well, correction, he was a comic book writer for many years, and he's also the creator of Static Shock. And he worked very uh, very heavily in the Justice League series. Um, and of course, he passed on. Um, February 21st of 2011 and ironically this film was released the day after um, his passing. Um, I'm a huge fan of his work and like I said though I did have my problems uh, though I did find my problems with the film and with the writing and with the story um, All-Star Superman is a very hard for any of you all who have read it you know it's, it's really hard to adapt that um, and I think that McDuffie did the best he could with what he had. Um, so I do commend his effort. Um, and also, I, I, I've never done this before. And like I said, I know I just spent like the last 20 minutes criticizing the film. But I actually do want to dedicate this review to his memory. Um, so, with that said, uh, my final thoughts on the film... Like I say, it's tough. It's really tough to adapt All Star Superman. Um, the graphic novel is just written that way. It's hard to adapt it. But I do commend them for trying. But I did feel like the movie did um, did fall short in a lot of ways. Uh, two themes um, because I haven't really talked about themes in the film, and I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up with this. Two themes that I felt the movie completely fell short of that the graphic novel achieved in number one the idea of Clark's identity um, because in the film they kept playing it off as he's either Clark Kent or Superman where we know that uh, in in the graphic novel that's actually addressed and it's answered because Superman Clark Kent he's not Clark Kent and he's not Superman he's a melding of the two because both of those personas were created by the real man who he is um that's not addressed in the film and i felt it should have i i felt like for lack of a better term they fucked around with that idea they didn't they didn't explore uh explore it the way they should have um the second which was my biggest problem with the film overall was the idea that the idea of superman's uh mortality Superman is, of course, one of the most OP characters in the DC Universe, and for all intents and purposes, he is somewhat invincible in many ways. The, 
You finally have a story where Superman has to come to grips with his mortality. The idea and the concept that he is going to bite the bullet, he is going to die. That is heavily explored in the graphic novel. And I don't feel like they did a good job in exploring it in the film. Now, yeah, you can go ahead and argue there's just not enough time. But like I said, this graphic novel, it, it dwells into so much so many ideas and so many themes that it's really hard to pull off in an animated film. Now, I felt maybe in a live action film, but it's really hard to pull it off in an animated film. And like I said, they tried their best, but I don't think they came through. So, so with that said, uh, once again, I'm going to use my five star rating system. I would give All Star Superman, I'd give it a three out of five, which is like a C. I'd give it a C because um, it was it was a decent film. It wasn't as impressive as the other DC animated films, but it wasn't as disappointing as say uh, Superman Doomsday. It wasn't nearly as disappointing as Superman Doomsday. Um, it was a lot better than that, but it still fell short of, say, like, Batman Under the Red Hood or Justice League New Frontier. Um, so with that said, I'm going to wrap up this review. I want to thank you all for joining me this week. Once again, as always, in the comments below, let me know what you thought of this review. Let me know what you thought of the film, but also leave suggestions for my next uh, review. Um... Which, like I said, this segment is going to be comic book adapted films only. Let me know what you all want to see. And of course, thumbs up. Thumbs up the comments you see for the movie you might want to check out. And until then, until next week, this has been Larry Williams, OAW Commander-in-Chief, signing off. And until next time, peace.